So uh, maybe just a bit of an introduction. Um, the legal challenges and dimensions for virtual conducts is something that I've been uh, very much diving into for the last two years, probably, because of the master thesis on global law and because of all the research that we've been doing in the blockchain space. Um, a bit of an explanation may be needed with regards to my name. Um, it's pretty much just a prevention mechanism so that it forces people to think twice with whom they're having a correspondence on Telegram. Um, basically, that's it. Um, we had a couple of scams um, like a month ago. Um, a bit of an introduction so that you know who you're speaking to. To most people, um, I'm pretty much known from the Ljubljana Legal Hackers, which is like a huge network of lawyers um, dealing with technology and law. Um, DGov is pretty much something that is being very much um, noticeable or at least people are being familiar with in the blockchain space. And then Marina and me are kind of um, covering the brand Unlocked. We are trying to find the synergies between the technology and the law. So how the law applies to whatever we, whatever we are creating right now. And then just recently, like last year, we've established the Future Law Collaborative, uh, which is gaining a bit more traction now that we're diving into the crisis of the COVID-19. Um, and yeah, okay, I've been kind of studying the international law uh, that's been my favorite part of the law. And I went to China uh, a couple of years ago because, well, our country did not really provide any of the master um, programs. And it was quite interesting because in China, I've been learning a lot about these um, principles of the international law. Among them, there was a principle of collaboration between states. And well, I was literally choking on the smog because there was no cooperation between states, or at least um, there was, but it was a bad one because pretty much the West exploited the uh, cheap workforce in Asia. And that's when I got a bit disgusted by the international law. So that kind of led me to dive into um, the weird parts of the law, that being space law and crypto law and blockchain law and, well, global law. Um, lately, we've been even going with the uh, meta-legal designs and meta-legal fields. Um, that pretty much means that we're trying to address or identify all the um, intersections between different legal areas, um, as well as all the rest of um, the disciplines, and then kind of connect them back to the law. Um, a bit of the information from where we come from. I mean, we've been talking about Slovenia and what the current situation is because of the quarantine and everything. But basically, both Marina and me are actually like born and raised. Um, in a country that no longer exists almost. Um, so we were, at least I was born in the era where in, um, when we had a separation war. And interestingly enough, the situation that we are facing right now, the lockdown, um, it's quite similar to what people went through in a separation war. So they were also locked down and had to hid in a basement and just waited for the whole thing to be kind of over. Um, and I think that a lot of people had it far worse. So there was a lot of refugees, a lot of migrants, um, people flee their home. Um, and I think that the word war still quite lingers in the back of our minds. Um, and people are quite afraid of it. But then again, I mean, it was like, what, 2015, when Bill Gates pretty much foresaw the whole situation with the COVID-19 now. Um, and I think that we have been a bit ignorant about it. Um, he even warned everybody that if anything is going to kill 10 million people in the next few decades, it's probably going to be the microbes. So it's kind of insane that we are now dealing with this situation and that, you know, he warned us about how we're not really investing a lot of um, money and energy to getting this preparedness plan. And here we are. It doesn't really look like we've been ready. But then again, what does it actually mean um, to be ready? Um, when are we going to be ready? What is that? Uh, first thing that kind of popped my mind is who are we? Uh, what are we actually trying to protect here? Or who are we building the pre um, preparedness plan for? And as much as we are now discovering these robots and networks and semi-autonomous contracts that we're constantly addressing in the blockchain space, um, as much as we are dealing with Sophie and as much as we gave her almost like human rights, at least we gave her a passport, I think that those things are still things. And we evaluate them because we, the humans, are providing them the value. Um, we are investing into them and we kind of utilize them. So as far as I'm concerned, we is still very much human centered and not robot robots or anything like smart contracts or autonomous organizations. It's still very much um, what we want to do. And then what it means to be ready. 
Right, so when it comes to preparedness plans, um, I kind of like to start where, where we are today, where we are right now. And a lot of people are addressing the VUCA world, so volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambitious. Um, but basically what that means, and this brings me back to where we all started, like with the international law and how I felt disgusted in China, is that we have 193 countries and all these global leaders we're not able to come together and sign like a Kyoto agreement or a Paris agreement and agree on the terms to kind of tackle the global crisis that we have with climate. And now we have this lockdown of what, 2.6 billion people worldwide that happened overnight. So apparently there is some coherence that we are able to achieve, even though we do live in a VOCA world. Um, and this is where um, the legal designs and the legal dimensioning actually starts. Um, so we now have 2 billion people kind of locked down, sure, and we are um, exposing or kind of feeding up our economies with trillions of dollars, right? Uh, but then again, what that means is that because we are so much relying on the govern governments right now, when we are so exposed or squeezed into the corner, the governments can pretty much do anything to us. So you can already see a lot of these measures um, coming into the existence. A lot of um, governments across the world are um, right now passing the laws that are kind of allowing them to surveil us. Um, so there is like technology that can be utilized to track our location, um, to gather our biometric data. Um, and what has been done with Cambridge Analytica can now be done even like the measures can be even harder. So it's becoming worse and worse. But then again, um, I do believe that we kind of optimized quite a lot of our behavior patterns. And with that being said, I mean, we've all been on the autopilot and we had to come to a stop. So what is happening right now with the lockdown really is our own rage quit almost. So I do believe that with the world that we lived in before, um, the laws that we've been passing, um, everything that lawyers have been observing for the last couple of decades, that has been um, done with technology and how technology ran against and how, for example, the blockchain space always um, introduced these ideas of having the anarchism, which is going to go against the governments. All these things led one to another, but the automation was happening all the time. And really, we applied, we applied the automation to the inefficient operations as well, which just magnified the inefficiency in return. Um, and now the whole question is what is becoming our new normal? And with that, I mean, it's quite funny. Okay, the flattering curve, I'm not even going to address because that's something that actually has to do with the quarantine and how we actually um, do things together when we are um, thinking about the complex designs. But what is happening right now is uh, the shift of powers. And the legal dimensioning actually happens in several dimensions. So the first couple of, of dimensions that we've created were um, the law of the sea, pretty much, and the waters, the law of the land. So how do we distribute the land and how do we create the boundaries between nation states? And then there was the law of the air um, and then the space laws. Those are the four dimensions that are pretty much covered and in control of the nation states. And then there's the fifth dimension that is pretty much the virtual dimension. And when you check what the new normal is with the virtual dimension, it's pretty much led by the private sector. So right here, um, especially in the situation of COVID-19, whenever you open up the Google or Facebook or Pinterest or whichever of these platforms and you wanted to search the COVID-19, all these platforms were actually the ones censoring those search results. What that actually tells me is that we don't really need the control of the states. We don't really need the measures being applied by the states alone we can just follow up with what the private sector is going to tell us that we might be searching and getting in return and what is going to be censored. Mm, I did put the Bitcoin somewhere on the graph as well, because I do believe that it's not reaching as much adoption as the rest of the applications, but it does have um, a completely new autonomy on the market. So as much as these private sectors and as much as these private organizations are now becoming more and more um, of a regulator, I do believe that there is like an autonomous force on the, um, not really just the market, but in our society that will allow another shift of the powers, um, not only between the public and the private sector, but also like 
we are as citizens regaining that power uh, back. So yeah, what is happening right now with the lockdown, it's not only that we are relying on the governments, but we are more and more going into the digital world as well. So I'm not sure how many of you have parents that have to um, go on Zoom calls today or how you've transitioned into the technical world. For me, that was something that I was very much integrated in already. So I've worked remotely before. Uh, I've been utilizing a lot of the, these digital tools, but I can see that more and more people are jumping on board as well. So for example, Zoom has already um, said to everybody, hey, can you please join the calls 15 minutes late because our servers are simply like thrown away. And um, I think that that's actually happening uh, more often. And this is not only becoming a new normal, but it's also going to be the post-COVID world. Um, and while everybody is telling us that we should sh kind of wash our hands, nobody's really telling us how we should be careful about um, our digital footprint that we are living today um, in a virtual space. Um, I yeah, we can interject right there. I mean, that's really the whole point of this portal that we've built. It's running on Jitsi, it's auditable, exactly. it's running yeah. on our own server, um, and it's being built out so that so that we're prepared for the for this coming future, which is not the next three months, it's the next years. And sorry to, to interject there, but I'm totally on your page. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to include that because I think that what you've done and how fast you reacted, that's like one of the most important elements to be first on the market is one, but to actually provide all these solutions to a lot of people. Um, it's interesting that like in Future Law Collaborative that I mentioned before, we have the idea, we had the idea of Future Law Virtual Summit um, in December 2019. And we were looking for a lot of lawyers that might actually support the idea. And a lot of them were just saying to us, you know, why would anybody want to um, kind of do the network in a virtual space? And it was so funny to me, like, what is it? Are you so inclined to travel across the world? Or why is it that we uh, emphasize the personal touch that we have so much? Um, and it became very clear to us that a lot of these tools that we have today were just not optimized enough, the user experience was not good enough, or we just haven't um, kind of created the fullest potential of it or used the fullest potential of it. Um, so right now what you are creating is incredibly important. I can see that the user experience has become more like better and better. And it's not only about that, it's also about how are we going to um, collect all the knowledge that is being shared among speakers. So for example, what is happening right now is that a lot of people are now creating podcasts a lot of people are actually going into the mode of becoming editorials, um, editors for not only how we create the videos and the podcasts and the audit, um, audios and stuff like that, but also how are we going to then combine all these knowledges and how are we going to collect the speakers so that we really do something together that is going to be tangible and possibly um, shifting the powers um, that are now being established in the world. So. Um, yeah, that being said, I do believe strongly that the global law is being created already. That's been one of the questions that we had uh, the call with Diga of Community two weeks ago. Somebody proposed that we describe our um, imagined best world scenario, like the best governance system, and how soon we think that it's going to happen, like 10, 30 years, maybe 50, maybe 100 years. And while I just said, I think that it's happening already, we're just a bit in a denial and being a bit ignorant, because if you actually take into the account who today are the regulators and who are those um, organizations or the actors that are providing us with the rules, I do believe that the private sector is heavily imposing the rules on us. We just don't recognize it as such because we are kind of captured in a traditional way of thinking that the governments and the regulators that we know today are the ones that are um, providing us with those rules that society abides to, but it's not really. I mean, we now have organizations like, like companies like Google and Facebook that are twice as rich as our country is ever going to be, right? They could easily buy us off. It's just that we've been establishing these powers of separation of powers and the nation states for centuries now. So you cannot just overthrow the idea of having the sovereign nation states, but it's happening step by step. You can see that China um, is already investing a lot into Africa, into Balkan, into countries like that, into its infrastructure. And you can see that, for example, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook have already in invested quite a lot 
into the established um, establishment of the cables that provide us with the internet. So at the end of the day, it's all about who collects the information that is then necessary for someone to take the decisions. So with that, we begin to understand who are the decision-making actors. And with that, we actually come to understand that we now have um, different actors, different regulators. And it's not only just the private sector and the public sector, um, it's also about the integration of both of them, which quite often happens with the NGOs, um, some of them being heavily supported by the governments, even though they are called the NGOs, but quite a lot of them um, are supported individually by donations and by different sectors. Mm, and like in 2000, 2002, I believe, there was a research that kind of showed that there is 1,600 billion invested into the NGO market, which pretty much means that the NGOs themselves um, can amount to like the fifth biggest economy in the world, uh, which is crazy, in my opinion. So we kind of have quite a lot of stakeholders that are providing us with all these informations and rules. We're just being a bit ignorant and still think that the governments are the ones that are going to do everything for us. And if we do a bit of a reverse engineering here, um, going from what states are kind of controlling today, um, it's pretty obvious that they are not really in the control of the virtual space um, because it's so broad and so out of scope. Um, so states are no longer the ones that are the only regulators. Um, and it's becoming more and more clear with the crisis that we go through. And it's not only the um, epi epidemic that we are currently going through. I do believe that it's not the first or the last one. It might actually be the one that really got a lot of media awareness, but you know we had epidemics before and we'll, we will most probably have them in the future, um, probably even more often. Um, it's really is just about how do we get the preparedness plan and how do we get ourselves ready. Um, and then be, that being said, we do kind of have to um, not only build on preparedness plan, but rather build like an army of all these people that are going to um, advocate their own power positions. And that happens through an interdisciplinary and very much with a meta, meta legal um, approach. So that means that we do need to kind of dive into the weird legal spaces. Uh, not only space law, not only global law, but more or less into the meta-legal uh, designs and kind of seeing what's the intersection between these different legal dimensions um, and create communities so we kind of have the tribes that we uh, work within. And that's pretty much it. Uh, two questions. Yeah. What are the aspects of this that really get at you personally and ethically? just because of who it is that you are. You're obviously an intrinsically motivated person. And then which aspects of, of what you see happening and what's coming um, really annoy you professionally? So give us a little bit of a, uh, you know, how and how those two things intersect. Yeah, and then maybe take that to a call to action. Sure. Um, I think... I'm just deeply disturbed by how the educational system works, especially from for lawyers, because um, right now it more or less just serves the traditional actors. It more or less just serves all those who are exploiting our uh, wisdom that we generate through, let's say, 10 years of education um, for the legal profession. Right. Um, so that was deeply disturbing, especially when I saw that, you know, I'm joking here. Um, the smog is not going anywhere. And it literally like at that time, it meant that I spent 14 days without clean air. And I'm not sure if that's imaginable for a person that actually comes from the West. Before, I saw those pictures with people wearing the masks, and I was aware of the problem. But when you experience it by yourself, not having a fresh air for 14 days is basically like not having a water, a glass of water that you could drink. So that to me was completely out of place. And I was really disturbed by how the politics are incapable of doing anything. Um, and the fact that we now are able to um, kind of direct all the people to kind of stay at home and just be locked down while we spend over two decades just trying to get all the global leaders together to sign two accords that being the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, to me, that's stupid. To me, that's like pure 
I don't know, evidence that obviously we are able of coordinating those people and we are able of creating the cohesion and having this approach and taking those actions, but we just never did that. So we never did that because there was no um, imminent threat and apparently we need to go through a crisis that is going to put in danger people's lives. And I guess those that danger needs to be not just imminent but very direct. And if it's not directly killing people, then it's just not severe enough. While in fact the global climate crisis is very severe because guess what? They don't have the fresh air. <laughs> And I'm just like, what the fuck is happening here? So here, I think that I'm very deeply disturbed. I think that that's my ethical approach. I do want to do the change. Um, I do want to see um, the international politics being changed and the international laws and treaties that we create um, being changed as well. And one thing that I saw immediately was that those treaties, for example, have very hard sunset clauses. So sunset clause actually means that whichever country signs the agreement, they can also withdraw. What happened with Kyoto Agreement, um, actually the Paris Agreement, is, for example, that the USA just withdrew from the country. And the Sunset Clause said that the withdrawal takes four years. So if that clause would say that the withdrawal actually takes, let's say, 10 years, then the American citizen would actually have the opportunity to vote for another president that would kind of support the climate crisis response mechanisms. But they weren't really given the chance because of the sunset clauses in the international treaty. And to me, that's like the first approach that I would take is to change those treaties and those clauses. But it's not in the interest of any country because people are actually trading the emissions and people are getting money out of those trades. And because it's kind of on the exchange, because there is an exchange for the emissions, it's in everybody's best interest that we have more emissions. It's pretty much like cryptocurrencies. You need to have the volatility. You need to have people trading with the cryptocurrencies. So if you want to have the exchange, you need to have the emissions on the market. That's like insane. And those are just the small bits, right? Those are just one or the small legal areas that are creating this complex legal design. Um, but basically that's how it works on the international level. Yeah, yeah. Preach. You're preaching to the choir in this audience, man. If you look at the window, people are clapping and smiling, man. I mean, that nails it. It's, you know, we're the people who, who understand this. Bravo. <laughs> um, from Cobra over there. Um, so I guess um, let me let me come back a step and give a little bit of context about where design coming from to ask you the next question. Mm -hmm. um, so cryptocurrencies are, are for me, uh, you know, just our digital native, you know, cypherpunk version of an apocalyptic death cult. Um, you know, it's not really any different than, you know, it's an end of world uh, sort of a sort of a concept, right? Um, I've believed for a number of years that the only time that there's any space for the solutions that it is that we're developing, whether it has to do with transactional freedom or it has to do with governance, uh, has to do with management of commons uh, uh, property and stuff, that until the current institutions collapse, that there's not really space for something to, to, to grow new. Uh, and you know, the motivation here is that the things that we're working on are in place for people and communities to adapt as, as other things collapse. Taking that, you know, uh, this, the coronavirus thing for me is a pretty, is a pretty unimportant uh, factor in how it is that I look forward into the future. And you mentioned the climate crisis, right? I mean, this is just one simple thing that we have to deal with over the next 50 years. Um, how do you see new legal regimes developing? How is that going to happen? Is it going to be born out of economic incentive or is it going to be born out of a social incentive or is it going to be born out of absolute desperation? I think it's going to be all of them. Um... Might you will say, Cyprus, 
that is true. What does that mean? <laughs> He's saying it's a test run. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised actually. Um, so going back to the fact that it was kind of foreseen and that we could react better or that we could um, create a better preparedness plan, maybe that's not even um, the case or my objective here, because that would just mean that we again rely on the governments to do something instead of us. Um, I think that it's bank accounts overnight, 10%. Yeah, I think it's going to be um, the merger of all these coming together. Um, I think that it's going to be the intersection that is going to actually um, present us with new value exchange. So if we are now relying on money being the value that we exchange amongst ourselves, and on the other side, we have Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies that are still presented as being a bit anarchistic, um, I think it's going to be something in between. Um, I do have high hopes that the um, infrastructure that blockchain actually presents uh, provides us with a very good opportunity to kind of create better supply chains. And I do have quite high hopes that supply chains might be um, the solution providers here. How are the how are your colleagues in the legal space? Where how, what are the demographics of of digital digitally native colleagues? Um, you know, legacy colleagues, what is the general, is there any type of consensus? Are there multiple consensuses? Um, how much, how much protectionism is involved with, uh, with their own, uh, way of doing things? Oh, that's yeah. That's a very interesting question. I think that it very much depends on which jurisdiction they come from. Um, it's a cultural thing in my opinion. Uh, we just had a call yesterday. And surprisingly, we covered all the continents, but Antarctica. Um, I think that the measures that are now being presented, especially with regard to surveillance, uh, they come out of the need to kind of rely on someone to keep track of all the citizens' um, actions and conducts. In Asia, for example, what I've observed is that they kill the creativity right away. And it's um, like all the citizens are having very high respect of their governments. So everybody relies on them. And when government says something, everybody's going to obey. This is why they were so successful with all the measures that they accepted due to the COVID-19. Well, for example, when you present some measures here in Europe, the Italians, they just did whatever they wanted. And same happens here. I mean, people are having solidarity and they don't do shit because they know about other people going through, you know, the extra work that these actions present. But it's not as if we're going to be obeying whatever our government says. We want to live a very liberal way. Uh, we want to be very independent. And this is why we need stricter measures. This is why probably the surveillance is going to hit us very hard. While in Asia, nobody's going to be bothered. Nobody's going to think about, oh, this is breaching my human rights. Maybe some, but, you know, it's going to be a very small population. So same goes with lawyers. Um, whenever we speak with lawyers from Asia, they are very much aware, at least that was my personal experience, of how much um, these measures are breaching their human rights and how um, they're being, um, like how their liberties are being threatened. But then again, it's something that is very normal for them. While in our place, that's not normal. And the more these surveillance measures are going to be presented to us, the more we are going to go into another extreme, going with the anonymity and building on top of blockchain and building on top of everything that covers up our identity. So I think that okay, that's... Okay, but there's a, there's, a, there's a dilemma there. You know, when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about, I mean, the dream is transparency for institution and privacy for individuals. Yeah. Um, but we're building system where data is immutable. And as an interesting case, when we when we minted these NFTs uh, for the Shift Crypto Wallets and the key card uh, mm -hmm. late last night, we put it up to, to mint base and then we looked at it. Uh, we just did the, the copy paste text and we thought, okay, we'll we'll edit that later. And then we went back to the interface and wanted to make clear that people are not purchasing one of those of those wallets, but it's a raffle. And we couldn't change the text because it's on the blockchain, right? Congrats. So, uh, um, so this is the first post post mortem on that. 
mm -hmm. we thought, okay, we can buy all the tokens back and then and then issue new ones. But so there's, uh, I have this problem when people are always talking about blockchain without recognizing that all of this data were, you know, potentially immutably perpetuating forever on the chain. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, that, that I have a on? very liberal opinion on that, which might not be um, something that the other lawyers would consent to or would, uh, like, there's no consensus around that within my um, circle of lawyers. But my opinion is that whenever we have, whatever we are creating and whatever we do, actually, it's uh, permanently written in our culture. Um, and even when whenever we are communicating it to the outside world, it's out there. Um, and we have the possibility to amend that. So if we are given the possibility to change, it's not that we are deleting the old patterns and that we are deleting the whatever happened in the history, we're building on top of it. So if we are able to digest that, if we are able to process that and change our minds and then present our changed minds to the outside world, then that should be having some value as well. It's not about deleting the old stuff, it's actually building on top of it. If that's so right. would you would it be a fair assessment to say that you come from the school of uh, social solutions to social problems and not technical solutions to tech to social problems or where do you live where do you where are you on that spectrum I do believe that technology does not really narrate social change I believe that social change actually has to come before technical change um, or at least I would uh, honestly prefer if that would be the case um, but might as well go the other way around. So whatever the tech actually presents to us might narrate how we live and might actually do some changes. Yeah, cool. So we got four minutes left. Um, what can we do for you um, in the community? Uh, what would you like to see us, uh, you know, be uh, strongly motivated? to to work on sure so so far we are kind of creating the future law collaborative which is um a collaboration between lawyers um we are kind of rookie when it comes to how we use technology so i would very much ask you the digital experts to kind of be patient when we approach you and when we ask to collaborate with you because i know that lawyers are trying their best um but they are kind of slow when it comes to that um, and might go vice versa as well. So whenever we start talking about all the legal changes and how the legal measures are going to be imposed, um, you kind of need to be patient as well um, and adapt to that. That's pretty much Yeah, it. so a little bit more peer respect between the sectors, Yeah, I guess is what you're talking about. All right, man. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for submitting the talk. Uh, and Absolutely. Awesome job, by the way. Thank you.